Tom Sauer from here on campus at the USDA National Laboratory for Agriculture and the Environment. And he'll be speaking about field wind breaks, bioenergy reduction, and carbon sequestration. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Leanne. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue on with the Canadian theme, although the thread is getting thinner and thinner. <laughs> we have one author in Canada. Um, and I'm going to read the name of my um, co authors because I like the sound of some of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from Russia, Yuri Chendev. Our uh, Canadian uh, colleague is Guillermo Hernandez Ramirez, University of Alberta. Uh, my other colleagues are from uh, Russia, Alexander Gennadyev is from Moscow State, Alexander Payton is from um, Elgarod State University, Rick Paul here at Iowa State, Larissa Novik, Evgeny Zdrotnik, and Valentina Petina from Elgarod State University. And we work together on a uh, grant funded by the uh, Civilian Research and Development Foundation. And it also ties in something that John Court talked about earlier, Mennonites. Uh, those Mennonites were planting trees in the same steppes of Russia that Belgorod is, is located in. So why are we interested? <clears throat> well, we're interested in a lot of reasons, but uh, it invariably comes back to carbon, right? So you have afforestation of grazing land, uh, cropland, uh, use change, conversion to grassland, but you know, look at the carbon sequestration potential. That's why people are interested in planting trees. So I'm interested as a soil <coughs> scientist uh, for the improvement in soil quality. The carbon sequestration seems like a bonus. As an environmental biophysicist, I'm also inter interested in the microclimate modification which practices have. So there's um, many opportunities to manage your agroecosystem with these practices, and you know that's the fascinating thing about it. So uh, here's the um, the basic details of our grant. Um, three objectives there: we're looking at the carbon sequestration of the tree planting, and again the focus is on marginal agricultural land, not converting our best land to trees, but trying to convert do that conversion on the marginal marginally productive land. <coughs> and to do that across, across the climatic gradient in both the uh, central Russian uplands and the U.S. Great Plains. Uh, Rick Hall is the forester on the bona fide forester on the team uh, who is looking at uh, the uh, bioenergy potential of the above ground woody biomass. And uh, we're going to combine the above ground woody biomass and the soils to use Comet Farm to try and scale this up to a more of a spatial analysis, and that's really only for the U.S. portion of the, of the um, project. Oddly enough, Comet Farm isn't running in Russia yet, to my knowledge, but maybe something. Maybe something. We'll let the lower pass. <laughs> uh, so, um, Here's that, here's that shelter belt zone. So I mentioned uh, earlier today that this actually is a Prairie States Forestry Project shelter belt that we sampled. We also had a plant in, in Huron, South Dakota and Reynolds, Nebraska. Um, the three sites that I'll talk about in Russia today are from Kamenaya Steppe, Yamskaya Steppe, and Strelitskaya Steppe. Don't have, uh, I don't think I have any data from the 2013 uh, expedition, as my Russian colleagues like to call them, um, but that's where those sites are located, and that gives us a, even uh, a little broader range of some of the uh, climatic gradient that we're after. So, you know, we have a nice range here in annual temperature, precipitation, this hydrothermal coefficient, a little bit, uh, it's, a, it's a climate index, it's very old, Yuri learned it in the Russian Air Force. Um, it actually works quite well and it's very simple to calculate and it characterizes these sites quite nicely. But basically, uh, for the Russian sites in particular, I think most of you are kind of familiar with the Great Plains, you know from north to south, it's it warmer when you go south. Uh, and in Russia, the, the gradient is this direction, it's, it's desert farther uh, south and west, and so the gradient is from warm and dry to cooler and moist as you go. Um, north and west. So here's the team, um, the teams, one of the teams. Uh, this is the, the group at Strelitskaya Steppe in uh, Russia. 
that's uh, recalled here, and our, our Russian friends, uh, Yuri Chendev. And this group of, uh, you know, there's no mechanization on this project. We were digging soil pits, and we're using raw, young Russian manpower. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are really good with shovels, and uh, it, was, it was fantastic digging soil pits in these uh, windbreaks and crop fields. Um, and getting permission to, to cut down trees was difficult because they're, you know, they're not collective farms anymore, they're cooperative farms. And so uh, they don't like cutting down the trees. So we didn't have cut down any trees in Russia, we wasn't allowed to do so. Uh, but there are trees everywhere. And so finding uh, windbreaks to uh, sample was quite easy because we went back to the document, the possibilities of shelter belt plantings. Raphael Zahn referenced sites in Russia. Yuri went to all those same sites in Russia, and so we sampled windbreaks near the reserves mentioned in the possibilities uh, document. For me, it's a little harder to find uh, sites in the U.S. with uh, land, uh, landowners who are interested in letting us uh, cut down trees, but we did accomplish that at a couple of locations. Um, we also had collaboration with NRCS folks, terrific collaboration. Um, so we have an NRCS uh, soil scientist here, Lance Howe in South Dakota, and uh, you know they brought out equipment to help us with the same. Nice range in soils, uh, tree species. I actually had a Manitoba maple uh, windbreak in Russia, of all things, plant um, apparently imported box elder plant windbreaks, and they're reasonably common. <laughs> I know. You can't even buy a box elder seedling in the U.S., can you? Um, and then, you know, we have uh, pretty good information on the cropping history as well. The Russian sites, you know, they've been cultivated longer, uh, but, but uh, pretty much, in some cases, almost entirely monoculture as well. The methods, um, two approaches here. We had a grid where we took shallow 30 centimeter soil cores on this grid, and then we had the soil pits, where the Yuri and Alexander are pedologists. They did full profile descriptions, and we sampled through the soil profiles as well. So uh, those, those pits generally went to about a meter and a half. Uh, they collected samples from three sidewalls, and they also did bucket auger uh, samples along the way so that uh, we didn't dig a pit in the wrong place. We had a little bit more confidence with those three sample sampling points that uh, the pit was representing. Uh, plant tissue analyses. Uh, so we collected um, uh, forest floor, um, understory, tree, crop residue, all those kind of samples. And then uh, the suite of analyses here. Organic carbon, total N. We did um, isotopic composition. Um, yeah, so and then basic soil characterization, pH, texture, etc. We'll focus a little bit on this Nebraska site. Um, the Norfolk, Nebraska is, by the way, Johnny Carson's hometown. And, uh, so Johnny grew up somewhere right over here. Um, he probably went snipe hunting in these very same shelter belts. Uh, but our sampling site was right here. Um, so we know these were planted, I believe, in 1942. And it had alfalfa on one side, and this was planted to corn on the other. It's an east-west running shelter belt. And uh, we have the planting plan, and uh, this plant, these trees have reseeded, and uh, about uh, doubled the number of species due to natural uh, regeneration inside the winter. One of the first things Yuri said was, Tom, there's a ridge in the middle of the belt. What is it? Tom said, I don't know, so Yuri got a shovel, and we're pretty sure what had happened is that there was a erosion event, probably early in the um, planting of the windbreak, and it piled about 60 centimeters of topsoil in the middle of the windbreak. And so this is topsoil all the way, all the way through. This is the adjacent field on the north side where the A or A plus B horizon is uh, at about that depth. So it was as effective as a wind control, wind erosion control if you consider trapping the sediment inside the windbreak as, as control. So this is the same slide I showed, showed this morning. And uh, 
So we have the, you know, the gradient from north to south and the U.S. sites. The shaded areas are the areas that were in trees. Uh, the Huron site with a tree planting and it's just got crop on one side. Um, the other two are windbreaks, uh, proper windbreaks, and, and the Russian sites are all proper windbreaks where we could sample crops on both sides and the trees in the middle. And as indicated again, in the, this is the grid data. So I've taken the grid data and reduced it into a, a transect across the windbreaks. And uh, on average, we had an 18.5% increase in soil organic carbon in that 0 to 30 centimeter length. Of course, what we're interested in is, is that higher carbon content because of less erosion there? Is it because of deposition? We know it's a deposition likely at, at um, Norfolk, although we don't see uh, evidence of dep deposition at other sites. So we use the stable isotope technique to try and, and identify the source of that carbon. And so we have data here from just two of the sites uh, Norfolk and Huron. And so um, the result at Norfolk is that in the 0 to 15 layer, 81% of the uh, carbon beneath the windbreak is treated. In the 15 to 30 centimeter layer, it's 46.8%. And the residence time of that carbon is 42 to 117 years. So it's also quite stable, which is consistent with you know, organic material from, from weed sources. And that's a 70-year-old windbreak from the sample. Huron, these are all, only 19-year-old green ash, but for the, you know, the same approach here, it's interesting that already 30% of the carbon in that 0 to 15 layer, 15 centimeter layer, is from a tree source after only 19 years. So it suggests to us, and, and also the residence times are also uh, reasonably long. So suggesting to us that it's a fairly rapid accrual of organic matter in that surface layer from tree sources, which you know, the conventional wisdom is that after you plant trees, you lose carbon for a while, it's a net loss before you can rebound. So apparently we're rebounding pretty quickly at a place like Huron. We have other data in Iowa that shows that that, that rebound is slow. So some of this is certainly climate and site, uh, site specific. Looking at the profile data, um, this is just for the American sites here. Uh, so we've got Reynolds soil organic carbon here on in Norfolk, and we have also inorganic carbon at the um, Reynolds and Huron sites as well. Generally, what we see uh, when we're comparing um, tree, crop, and grass for each of these is that we have, uh, again, less organic carbon in the cropland. We saw that in the, the data from the uh, grids as well, so the pit data, thankfully, agrees with the um, shallow sampling. We also have less and deeper inorganic carbon underneath the trees, which ha probably has to do something to do with the change in hydrology, uh, water use patterns, and uh, temperature in the, the trees. And this is something that we've we are going to learn a lot more about because the sites we sampled in 2013 all had carbonates. Uh, in them. Now for the Russian uh, data, what uh, Yuri's done here is he's uh, shown the windbreak data in gray and then overlaid that with the arable land data and then we had a virgin grassland site in the reserves near each of those. So uh, compared to the arable lands, uh, Strelit Sky we have more uh, carbon near the surface underneath the windbreak, less at Yamskaya and Kamenaya, uh, comparable. But notice at Kamenaya, the uh, loss in carbon compared to the wind, or less carbon compared to the windbreak in the arable land is pretty consistent at depth. And compared to virgin grassland, the windbreak at Charlotte Sky has more carbon on the surface. <coughs> Yamskaya kind of just slightly less than the virgin um, grassland, and then at Kamenaya, uh, the windbreak has more carbon at the surface than the virgin grassland. The um, analysis with the hydrothermal coefficient um, 
is based upon the depth of that surface uh, organic rich surface horizon, whether it's an A horizon or an A plus or A A B horizon, depending on the uh, biology and the, you know, the descriptions of these guys. You know, it's all done in Russian. I'm I'm standing there, and you know, they're all doing it in Russian. Thankfully, Yuri translated later. Uh, I have no idea what they were talking about. Um, it was all Russian to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the bottom line is, Russia, uh, Yuri did not like the thickness of our organic day horizons in America. He claimed they were all way too thin. I uh, said that these are the richest soils in the country. What are you complaining about? And then we went to Russia, and I saw how deep their uh, a horizons are. Um, and actually, these seem sort of shallow. It seems to me more like a meter of dark black. So yeah, he, he was a little surprised by how thin our surface horizons are. Um, so you know, these are the depths that we have for the tree, the grass, which we tried to find an undisturbed site in each of our locations, and especially difficult in the U.S. Um, and it's the difference between these blue bars and the red bars that we compare for that thermal uh, hydrothermal coefficient here. So again, as I touched on a little bit uh, earlier, this is that climate index, and a positive number indicates that the depth of that organic rich horizon is thicker underneath the trees than it was under the native vegetation. So you're accumulating carbon greater than was there under the native vegetation. A couple of things I, I uh, want to uh, say about this is that these to look like outliers, and we think we know why. We are, I already talked about Norfolk. It had a big wind erosion event, so it's not a, um, it's a an erosion impacted site. So um, that we can explain away that data point. Um, likewise, this data point down at Reynolds was near a stream, and we think perhaps too near a stream, and so perhaps it was also receiving some organic inputs uh, during flood events. Other than that, it's sort of, uh, I think, uh, really compelling to us that the other data points fall upon this relationship quite nicely. Uh, even the 2013 de uh, data points shown, uh, Selfridge, Southheart, and Weibo, which we went farther north and west, they fall along here quite nicely. Um, uh, finally, a little bit about uh, the trees and about Comet Farm. Um, so what I did is I took our, our three sites here and uh, ran, uh, I call it Comet 2.0 on you, you have to tell me, it is really Comet Farm. Yes. Now it is, there used to be a Comet. Yes. And we originally developed all these uh, Um. Comet said that we're losing carbon at Reynolds and Huron and gaining at Norfolk. Uh, these are the predictions for biomass and then the total, uh, three total tons per hectare per year. Uh, SS, uh, soil organic carbon tons per hectare per year. And then um, if it was, or if it was in cropland or if it was in grassland. So essentially I ran the same simulations as, as if it stayed in crop, stayed in grass, or was converted from, I think I, whatever the land use was, it was always crop, converted from crop to trees. So I ran those simulations. Um, and then we have the, the measured data over here. Notice that I have those all in green in tons per acre per year. Um, Comet said that we were losing carbon here at Reynolds and Huron. The Huron I could get because, again, it was that young site. And I thought, well, maybe it hasn't quite uh, regained the loss that comes from planting. Uh, but Reynolds, I, or, uh, sorry, um, Reynolds, I couldn't quite understand why. And it did, Norfolk was our oldest site, and it did show that it was a, a carbon there. So, you know, that was good. Um, we do have uh, data for the trees from Rick Hall for one of the sites, the Huron site, and he broke that down in between stem uh, and live branches and dead branches. And that was the estimate there for uh, tree biomass, 0.8465 tons per hectare per year versus um, tree biomass of 
from um, so that part seems okay. It's the soil part that just didn't seem quite um, quite right. That might not be the composition. Pardon? You consider the composition of uh, soil organic carbon and on the young side. Uh, sorry, I'm not following your question. The decomposition of the soil the organic, the organic matter in its peak and the leaves, you know. Mm -hmm. So that, that might be, the accumulation might be less. You know. Well, yep, I, I think, and, and I talked to Mark last year about this. The, the point was um, when the trees are young, the biomass inputs are low. And so that generally reduces the model predictions of growth. But it's not only the biomass input, it's the fact that it's, in most cases, it's no longer tilled or cultivated, or there's maybe grass growing in between the trees. So it's hard to separate out potential differences in management <coughs> with that conversion and how those all might interact to affect that early carbon. Um, because I think later, yes, it's dominated by the inputs that are fall through decomposition. It's the early part that's a little, uh, little iffy. And he admitted that that's, that's the challenging uh, time to, to make those predictions. Um, for Russia, I, I, just putting up some of the data here, there's our good Manitoba make, maple on Acer Nagundo. Uh, so Rick did make measurements of stem volume and stem uh, dry weight. Not being a forester, I'm not sure if that is, um, you know, if these are high totals, if they seem to be pretty good uh, windbreaks, fair amount of biomass there. They're also very wide, multiple, multiple rows. Uh, so it was truly a forest-like environment underneath those um, those windbreaks. Well, to summarize, you know, this is all couched by you know the the uh, issue about growing more food for more people, and um, the, in the United States anyway, not so in Russia at all, but in the United States, a lot of interest in biomass as well. Um, biomass production for carbon sequestration and or use for bioenergy, whatever that might mean. Um, and limiting that to our marginal lands. So, you know, agroforestry, and I, and I was uh, delighted to hear about uh, windbreak res restoration work in South Dakota. Um, I think that's a, that's a great opportunity because the, the alternative is, is just removal. And that's one of the justifications that we used in writing this proposal was about what to do with those future windbreaks. Well, if bioenergy has got your interest, well, let's talk about producing biomass for bioenergy. That's the kind of motivation that we want. Um, you know, I'd summarize some of the changes in soil organic carbon. Earlier today, I talked about all the benefits that that brings to your soil. And certainly, if we were planting trees into a degraded site, that's a terrific opportunity to improve the quality of that soil, the hydrologic function, the ecosystem services that it, that increased organic matter is going to provide. Um, the Russians believe that soils change much faster. Soil properties change much faster than, you know, I have three degrees in soil science. When Yuri came, I thought he was crazy. He was talking about how these changes could happen in a few decades. He absolutely convinced me. And uh, so it's totally, changed my perspective on how fast these changes can happen. But it, what it really means is if you've got a degraded soil, uh, it's not just throw up your hands and walk away. Um, if you do the right kind of management, you can rehabilitate that soil, absolutely. Um, Yuri's convinced me that uh, this can be done, you can do this. Um, we have a SARE grant right now, Sustainable Ag Research and Extension, and in a couple weeks I'll be digging more holes <coughs> in the uh, Great Plains. They did a, a, a lot of survey work on the front end of that grant, partially, well, primarily, to see what landowners' uh, perspectives are on, on agroforestry, especially related to bioenergy, um, and also what their interests would be in the future. So, you know, we can sample what's out there now, but if we're gonna encourage new plantings, uh, we wanted to know what they might be interested in planting. Uh, they didn't. They didn't seem to be so much uh, 
very picky about species or practices or anything. They just wanted to make money. That's what they wanted was a system that was profitable. And I think there was a, actually, kind of surprisingly, uh, a high degree of interest. But they recognized that this is also a long-term investment. And so you know, they realized the risk in, in planting to know uh, when the payday is going to come and what that payoff is going to be down the road. And I have a lot of people to thank who uh, helped out with this project, people at our sites and uh, staff here at uh, my lab who help out with uh, you know, all the, uh, the hard work, the analysis. So with that, thank you. We have time for one question. And you've got it again. Go back to the previous slide, please. The second one. Where your arrow is coming there, is that, <coughs> excuse me, is that uh, biomass or carbon? Biomass. Okay, I, <coughs> I think you're out by an order of magnitude. Uh, the net primary productivity average for all forests around the world is 10. And certainly a 19 year old forest at that latitude would be producing easily seven to eight tons per hectare per year. So I'd suggest you talk to your forester about that because I think that's an error. So it could be, it could very well be, um, they weren't that big. It was a, not a particularly productive site and it was impacted by salinity. Okay. So, um, but I'll check into that. Thank you. Thank you. Huh?